Food plays a very important part in our lives. We understand that we need food in order to sustain our bodies so that we can develop and become productive beings in our communities. We also know that food provides vulnerable, marginalized groups in society to have pathways into economic livelihoods. In fact, the foods that we consume at home are sourced around the world, within the Pacific, and here locally in Tonga, from rural smallholder farmers. Food is also a important part of our cultures. It provides us with our identity. It's tied to our occasions, the emotions that we have. But food for tomorrow and for today is also under threat from climate change. So in order for us to move forward and have a robust and resilient food systems and an agricultural sector in Tonga, we need to start looking into integrating traditional knowledges from our forefathers who knew the lands and our natural resources intimately. The very same lands, the very same natural resources that we walk on and use today. So we start to ask ourselves, what are the agricultural traditional practices that we still see that are being practiced by small-scale rural farmers? We start to see practices of mixed cropping and intercropping. This allowed the farmers to stagger harvest times, reduce food wastages, and it allowed them to maximize arable lands because we're small islands, and arable land is precious resources for us. And by having a diversity of crops, it enabled the farmers to observe what were the mutually beneficial crops to grow alongside each other. So we started to form practices of growing tongue and tobacco around our vegetable patches. We started growing giant taro alongside other of our crops because much like mankind, our environments, the insects and the animals around us started to co-evolve. And they started recognizing that tongue and tobacco and, and giant taros became a natural deterrent for them. Tongan farmers are also using crop rotation. And by crop rotating, you're giving time to rejuvenate and rehabilitate the soil in which you are cultivating. So some farmers would leave lands to fallow. And again, this was very important because the building blocks of our food systems, of our agriculture, lies within the soil. We also see forms of agroforestry. So there were a lot of fruit trees that were planted in our tax allotments, the plantations that our fathers had, and also at home in the town allotments. And so this taught us to practice preparedness in times of hardships, because we knew, and it's recorded in our history, that our forefathers experienced climactic shocks, much like we are experiencing today though not to the certain degree that we're experiencing it, but we can draw valuable lessons from their practices. The proverb of Apifa'a Toitua'e Teve describes a person or a farmer who is well prepared for disasters. And there's something that we are missing from our Tongan diets, from the tables, is this lowly but yet humble and sturdy root crop of the elephant foot yam. And so the Tongans were able to prepare for food shortages, times of famine, prolonged droughts, because there were climate resistant crops, such as the elephant foot yam. I remember growing up, my mother telling me stories of way before we had sugar imported from the Western world, they derived sugar from the roots of the sea or the tea plant. That's innovation. We have at our expense technology, research, and science. 
What can we do to take tradition and integrate it to our food systems of today? And I'd be remiss to share with you my talk and not talk about the tongue and bread. Yes, my friends, we had tongue and bread way before the Balangis brought to our shores tongue and bread. So the practice of creating tongue and bread was in the time of abundance, the crops were gathered, the skin was removed, and much like preparing an underground earth oven, a pit was dug and the crops were laid into this dirt and was covered again. And over time, it would ferment, it would break down and would become a solid compound. And so during hardships of famine and food shortages, the communities would come together and would unearth this tongue and bread and prepare it much like the regular staples of the day. So what are the lessons that we're able to learn today? We can take our foods and our harvests and prolong it, preserve the shelf lives. Did you know that 80% of breadfruit goes to waste every breadfruit season. If we're able to take crops, dehydrate it, mill it down, and have flour, we can provide our people with low caloric and gluten-free alternatives to imported foods. And this can address the issues that we are facing today that surrounds health issues. And as we move forward, we also need to ask ourselves, who are the people involved? Who are the actors involved in our food systems? Who are vulnerable, marginalized groups that we do not think of often when we are planning and our policies? There are women, the youth, persons with disabilities. And so it's important that I press on to you when you hear this and when you go home to record and document traditional knowledges that's been passed down to you and your families through generations. We're living in a day and age where sharing information is as fast as that. We need to share. Do not document and record and archive. We need to share with these vulnerable groups so they can build resiliency to the impacts and the effects of climate change. Suddenly, thinking about the future and the uncertainties that it holds for us because of the pressures of climate change and leaping into the unknown almost becomes a challenge that I am willing to take because I'm taking and linking hands across generations to my forefathers in the past to ensure that I have food for today, for me and my family, and that I'm not disrupting food for the future generation. Malo abito.